Well, welcome to this tutorial which is going to look at recreating an effect which is quite popular among Cinema 4D users uh, which takes advantage of the MoGraph system in Cinema 4D which is getting a group of spheres in this case to cluster together and move around in an interesting way and it's quite possible to achieve this in Houdini and I'm going to show you how but before we do that let's have a look at the effect that we're trying to create. So that's the effect we're going to try and replicate and I'm going to, as in a number of recent tutorials, simply take you through uh, an established scene which I'm going to put up on the internet. Uh, so let's just press play and uh, we can see that what we get is the movement which you saw in the rendered version. So how do we go about achieving this? Well we're starting off with a rigid body point object uh, and this is created using the shelf tool here and to create it you need two things you need an object which you're going to copy onto the points and you need a source of the points well the object that we copy onto our points is in fact uh, this sphere we can see it here uh, we've just got a standard sphere of uh, radius 1 and then we project some UV coordinates onto its vertices. And then for the source of points uh, we're using this object called all the spheres and we start off with a box and the reason we start off with a box is we want to define the size of our volume and then I use an ISO surface node and I've got a noise function here noise dollar $x dollar $y dollar $z plus 100. Uh, the plus 100 is just to make it a little different from the default dollar $x dollar $y dollar $z. So what this does is cre create a volume because we have the build volume option ticked down here and it creates a volume and for each voxel it calculates the value at that voxel using uh, this expression and obviously dollar $x $y and $z are the x, y and z coordinates of that particular voxel. And the reason I want to create this noise is because I want to use a scatter SOP to scatter points into our volume based on the density of the volume. And in order to see these points we're going to have to turn on the display of points. And you can see there, let me turn off the grid a little bit slightly easier, we can see we have these points and the points, I'm not scattering very many, just 50 points, uh, but the points are being scattered more where the volume is dense and less where the volume is less dense. And this gives you a slightly more interesting result uh, than if you just simply scattered uh, points onto a volume where the density was the same everywhere. It's not absolutely essential uh, part of this type of simulation, but it just is an example of how you can make your points more interesting. Uh, the next thing I do is use a point SOP to add an attribute and the attribute, let me just enlarge this so we can see it, the attribute is the scale attribute which is sometimes called P scale and again I've got another expression here uh, and we can't, let me just edit this expression so that we can see it more clearly. So it's the minimum of 0.5 plus rand dollar pt times 0.5 and then another expression point referring then to the scatter node dollar pt pt area 0 divided by 2. So what's going on here? This looks rather complicated. Well the first part of this 0.5 plus rand dollar pt plus 0.5 is creating a random value between 0.5 and 1 for every single point in our collection. And it does that 
using a random number based on the point number and by adding 0.5 to it and multiplying it by 0.5 you get the value to be between 0.5 and 1. The second part of this is looking up a property on another node and uh, perhaps I can just minimize this. We can see uh, that the node that we're referencing is in fact the one directly before the current point node. So we're having a look on this node and we're saying what's the value of this attribute PT area at the current point and we're saying we'll take the minimum of this random value and this PT area attribute. So if the random value is greater than PT area then we take PT area and we divide the whole lot type by 2. So I guess the next question is what is PT area and the answer to that is it's an attribute which you can create uh, using the scatter sob. And if we have a look down here, we can see that we've enabled this option, compute nearest points. And we're computing the nearest, the single nearest point, and we're storing it in an attribute PT area. So PT area is going to contain the distance between this point and the next nearest point. And what this means is that we can ensure that when we add our random radiuses to our points, and that's essentially what the p-scale attribute is doing, we can ensure that they're scaled so that they don't overlap, because we can ensure that the radius is never larger than this pt area value. And that's where I would have left it uh, before using the shelf tool here. So to use the shelf tool, uh, one would click the shelf tool, you would then select the object whose points you're going to use, and then you would select the sphere and press enter again. I'm actually going to escape out of it because I've done it already. So let's uh, come down here. This is the DOP import that will be added by the RBT shelf tool when you use it. Uh, except I've altered it a little bit and I'm going to revert it back to its original value as it would be if it was just created by the shelf tool which is fetch the geometry from the dot network and we're going to put the display flag on this for the moment and we can see straight away that we're getting our spheres back out again from our dot network so let's have a look at that dot network so the dot network is here in the auto dot network as usual and it's got a number of different elements that are combining to produce that rather nice random motion. So when we used this shelf tool, the RBD point object shelf tool, this is the node it would create. Uh, it's called starting volume here because that was the name that I used originally for that collection of points. Uh, I've now re renamed it to all the spheres. But this is what would be produced by that shelf tool. And we can see uh, that it instances the sphere onto each of those points. And I've changed it so that it has use particle scale attribute enabled. Uh, if I left that off, you can see that all of the spheres have the same size. But the scale attribute that we set contains the radius that we'd like for the spheres. So if we enable this, then each sphere has a radius scaled by that p-scale attribute that we set in the point sop earlier on. The other thing that I've done is use these options here on rotation and angular velocity. And let's enlarge this so that we can see. There are two ways in which you can change the rotation and the angular velocity, the initial angular velocity for the objects that are instanced onto your points. One of which is to use an attribute which you put onto those points that you're using as the basis for your instancing. Uh, the other is to override the point value and in this case of course we haven't set a point value. Uh, so to replace the point value with whatever is in here. And I'm using a another expression uh, and it's a random expression based on dollar obj ID and I've just added something here so that it's not just a plain dollar obj ID uh, 
What is dollar object ID? Well, dollar object ID is the object number of the object that is currently being processed. Now, this node here is creating something like 50 DOP objects. Uh, and what it will do is it will evaluate this expression once for each of those objects and set this variable dollar object ID to a different number for each object. So by setting uh, the expression like this, we create a different initial rotation for every single one of our objects. As I said, the alternative would to be to set a different attribute on each of our points. And then that would also ensure that each object had a different initial rotation. The other thing I want to do is give each of my points, each of my spheres rather, a slight angular velocity. And the purpose of having this is it creates that little bit of extra interesting motion. And I'm using the exact same principle here. So this rand dollar object ID is going to produce a random number between 0 and 1, which is different for every single one of our spheres. And then I'm multiplying it by 20. So it's going to give me an angular velocity somewhere between 0 and 20 for each sphere. The next thing I do, uh, in fact, is to set here on the collisions tab, I ensure that we're using an implicit sphere as our volume collision type. You don't have to do this, it just happens to speed up the simulation if we do in fact have a sphere, which, which we do here. Uh, you can, of course, uh, use the standard laser scanning ray intersect method to create uh, your collision based object. The solver, I've not changed the settings on at all. So the next thing we get to is a magnet force. And if you've seen my video on DOPS forces, you'll know how to set up a magnet force. Uh, but I've done a couple of uh, special things with this one. So let's pop back out to uh, the scene level. So if I go back up to the scene level, here is the meta ball, which I just created using the meta ball uh, shelf tool here. Uh, and in fact, I've positioned it initially at the origin, so it really is uh, just a meta ball. But then the other thing I'm doing is overriding its position. And if we just switch this to hide other objects, we can see this at work. Because if I scrub through, we can see that the ball is moving about a bit. And because the magnet force in this case is going to be attracting the spheres into its center, if I move that center around, we're going to get a more interesting movement, a more interesting interaction between the force and the spheres. And that's why I've got this transform here. And you'll see that the translation values of the transform are this orange color. And the reason they're an orange color is because I have created a motion FX to add noise to uh, that, uh, that parameter. And we can see we've got our motion effects network down here. You can reach that, in fact, by going to the motion effects menu. And you can't see it here, but you can select jump to effect network. Uh, and that takes us down into that chop network. And we can see that uh, what it's doing is taking the transforms uh, there are three transforms, TX, TY, TZ. If we middle click here, we can see there are three channels, TX, TY, TZ. So that's the transforms being brought in. And then here, what this is doing is creating uh, three separate individual noise tracks. And we can visualize, visualize this using a motion view. So we can see we've got three noise tracks here. And I've changed the amplitude here so that they're going between roughly uh, minus 5 and plus 5, not quite, uh, sorry, minus 2.5 and plus 2.5, so not quite uh, reaching those outer limits. But you can see we've got three independent noise tracks, one for the X, one for the Y, and one for the Z component of our translation value. And then I'm just using this node here to add the noise to the existing values course, in fact, the existing value is zero. So we add in the noise, and then because this 
toggle is set on, we are exporting that back to our transform node here. So how would you do that uh, from scratch? Well, I'm just going to demonstrate here on, on say this node here. I would go motion effects. Uh, you can't see the menu, but uh, what I would do is come down here and add noise. And we can see this panel comes up here, which is uh, giving us the options for the noise. So I can change the amplitude, change the period and so on. And that then has overridden these values on rotation. And if we have a look inside our motion effect network, what we should find, there we are, is that there are now two separate networks. One of them is overriding those rotation values. Uh, let me get rid of that because in fact I don't need to rotate my sphere. So motion effects, enable effect, I'm going to tick that off. And you can see that's now been disabled. So by moving this metaball around, I'm going to create a more interesting force. Again, I've just created this force using uh, the shelf tool here, drive simulations. And if we have a look here, there's the magnet force. And when you use the shelf tool, you need to select uh, the metaball that you're going to use as the magnet force, which is the one we've just created. And that will then lay down in our dot network a magnet force, which is what we have here. We can see there are two parts to this. There's the force, where we can set the scale of the force, and I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but there's also this SOP geo node, and what this is doing is bringing in that metaball geometry. And it's worth noting that we've got the default operation here to set always. And that's important if our SOP geometry, if our metaball is animated anyway. And in this case, as you saw, we've animated the position of the metaball. So to ensure that that's reflected, that animation is brought into DOPS, you need to make sure that uh, this default operation is set to set always. And that means that the position of uh, the metaball will be updated at every frame. So this is fed into our magnet force. So the other thing I've done to make the movement more interesting is I've animated this parameter, the scale of the force. And I've also set this, as you can see, to set always to ensure that that is reflected in uh, the movement and in, in the evolution of the simulation. This value will be set at every frame. So we can see what that animation looks like by switching to the channel editor. And then if I click and drag on the label for that parameter into the channel editor here and release, we can see the values being displayed here. So this is starting off at frame zero with a value of 50. It then goes down, dips down to a very slightly negative value, minus four. And then it goes back up to 70. Then it goes to 70 again and finally it goes down to minus two. So when this value is positive uh, what it does is attract the balls, the spheres, to the center of the magnet, to the center of the metaball, and when it's negative it repels them. And by animating this we get that nice variation in the movement which we can see here if we play through. So it starts by attracting them we can see they're, they're moving around here because, because the uh, center of the metaball is moving around with the animation. And then that's the first keyframe. So it's now, you see they're starting to fly apart, but there isn't much chance for them to fly apart because we go back up to a value of 70. Let me just stop the simulation so you can see that. We can see we're at a value of 75. Uh, so that's lets them go for an instant and then drags them back again. And if we continue to play, this will simulate through and it will then eventually reach the point here on this frame where that is going to drop permanently to a negative value and that's going to force them all apart towards the end of our simulation. 
let's just wait for that to simulate through. So now it's dropping. What we should see is them starting to fly away more or less now. There we are, they're starting to fly apart. And then we eventually get to the end of our simulation. In fact, let me stop this now. And we can see that this force scale is now minus two. I can't tell you precisely what scales to use here uh, on your force. It depends entirely on the weight of your spheres, the density of your spheres, how far they are from the magnet and so on. I also can't tell you how big to make the initial uh, metaball. In this case, I gave it an initial radius of something quite big, 12, so it almost envelops all of the initial positions of the spheres. And you probably need to have a pretty big metaball in order to get the force to work. The other thing I should say uh, that I did is reduce the mass of the spheres so they're a bit easier to manipulate. And you can do that here on this node, this RBD point object node, which is the first thing that's created. And you do it here on the physical uh, tab. And what you can see I've done is override the rotational stiffness. This is because I want them to rotate when they hit each other. Override the bounce value uh, in order to ensure that they're not uh, very bouncy. If they were very bouncy, then what would tend to happen is as they bash into each other, they fly right off again. And finally, I've reduced the friction quite a bit so that uh, they can easily rotate round each other. And the other thing I've done here is change the density from its default value of, I think, 1,000 down to 10. Uh, and that allows us to use much smaller values in uh, these forces here, uh, values like 50 and, and 2 rather than 500 and 2,000. But this magnet force, uh, which is, as we noticed, moving is not the only thing which is creating this interesting movement on the spheres. There's one more element. And that element is down here. And it's a uniform force uh, with a torque applied. And what the torque does is rotate things about uh, the center. Uh, so in this case, it's going to rotate 10 in each direction uh, and create a swirling motion. Uh, but I want this to change at every frame. And the way I can do that is by randomizing these values. Now I could randomize these values by using, uh, for example, an expression here with a random number based on the frame. Alternatively, I can attach a noise uh, dop and I'm creating here values between minus one and one and they're pretty much uh, going to always take the value that it's the center but if I offset that noise by the frame divided by five what's going to happen is that that value is going to change at every 20 frames or so and that's going to mean that the exact components of torque that are being applied will evolve as the simulation progresses. The other thing I could have done, of course, is use the motion effects menu to add some noise using a chop network. Uh, and that would have worked equally well if I'd set this to set always. So there are various, various different ways that you can randomize this. Let me just switch this off for a second so that we can have a look at our simulation without it and we can see that it's slightly less interesting. And in fact of course I've switched off the wrong thing now. I've switched off the drag which is the last also switch this off and we can see now we don't get quite as much of that interesting rotation as there is when this is applied. And we can see we're getting much more interesting rotation 
with this applied. And the final thing I've got here is a drag force. Uh, the drag force simply ensures that things don't rush away uh, too quickly and the forces don't get too great. And you can increase this if you want a, a slightly more sedate uh, simulation. So that's broadly speaking how you create the random movement of those spheres. But there are a couple of final points that I want to go into. The first of those is on the dot network itself. So let's have a look at that. And this dot network is the perfectly standard set of parameters apart from this one here, where I've set the scale time to 0 0.6. And I want to say a little bit about what this means and why I've done it. Well, quite often when you're setting up a dot simulation, you need to balance a number of forces and effects to get the kind of interaction that you want. And then you play it through and you decide, well, maybe uh, it looks fine, but it's running a little bit too fast. The balls are moving around too fast. It's all a bit too violent or the reverse. It's all a bit too slow. The scale time parameter allows you to vary the speed of the simulation as a whole uh, by varying uh, the rate at which time is flowing if you like. So in this case what I've done is I've scaled time down and that has the effect of slowing the simulation down. So if this has a value of less than one then we're slowing things down. If it has a value of greater than one uh, then we speed things up. So uh, what does this mean in practice? Well I've set up uh, here somewhere a null and I've just added some parameters to it uh, using the, the add parameters dialog box here and I've typed in these expressions $st and $t, $sf and $ff. Now st as you know is the simulation time so that's the time as experienced inside this dot network. SF is the simulation frame, so that's the frame number as experienced inside this network. And $t and $ff are the time and the frame uh, across the whole scene uh, outside the dot network. Uh, and if we have a look through here, let me just click these so that we're displaying the values. We start off, as you'd expect, with exactly the same values. But as we step through the scene, we can see that the rate of time in the outside world, if you like, is pressing ahead much faster than the time inside our simulation. Uh, although the frame numbers are staying the same. They're both at uh, 30, 13 in this case. So what does this mean? Well, it means uh, that the forces inside here, which depend on time, and of course uh, they all uh, depend on time including uh, this metaball force and so on. All of the RBD simulation steps are based on calculations uh, on time steps. Uh, all of those will be scaled so that they will operate more slowly in this case than if you like the real world time. Anything that's based on a frame number will however stay at the same rate uh, and this means that, for example, uh, the movement of this SOP geometry here, uh, our metaball, the movement of our metaball stays exactly the same uh, inside the simulation and outside the simulation because this is animated outside based on the frame number and that doesn't change. So this is going to move around at the same rate. It's not changed by this parameter here but the forces are going to change and operate more slowly by scaling the time. So it's important to remember that difference uh, when you're using this parameter. So I'd now like to look at how we texture the spheres. And if you remember, we've got some texture coordinates applied to our single sphere. And when I bring this in from DOPS, I can see that uh, 
we get the texture coordinates coming through. I then apply a connectivity SOP. And a connectivity SOP is going to give us a primitive attribute class, which is going to be the same on all the primitives that are part of a single sphere. And it'll be a different value for the next sphere and so on. And we can see this if we have a look at the primitive attributes. And we can see that all of these have a value of zero. Then, as you can see, 0 to 49. Each individual sphere has a different value of class. And then I can create an attribute. And the attribute I create is called base color map. And I'll explain in a moment why it's called base color map. But it's primitive attribute. And it's a string. And it's going to be a reference to the texture that we're going to use for this particular sphere. And this is the value. I'm going to just edit this expression again so we can see it more clearly. It's a little bit hard to see because of the, the coloration of, of the parts of this here. But it's a string and we start off with $hip slash image slash texture and that's a directory and then the beginning of a file name. The file name is beginning with the word texture and then a dot and then I've got a, a backtick here and I've got another backtick here and then I've got dot png and this stuff between the backticks uh, is going to be evaluated by Houdini for each primitive and it's going to produce a value between uh, 1 and 5 uh, and it works by taking the value of class making it into a random number between 0 and 1 timesing it by 5 that gives us a random number between 0 and 4 then takes the floor of that to get an integer and adds 1 to it so we end up with a number between 1 and 5 and we can see that if we have a look now at our attribute here right at the end we should see that we're getting different values of this number here. So this is allowing us to assign a different texture map to each sphere from a choice of five different ones. Uh, and the reason we've called it base color map is to take advantage of one of the ways in which Mantra works. And if I have a look at my shop node here, my, my shop context, I can see that I've got a Mantra surface shader. And if I have a look down on the diffuse tab here, there's an option to use a color map, in other words, a texture map. And then uh, there's a parameter here which allows you to choose the texture map to use. And I've left it blank. And if we hover over it, we can see that its name is base color map. Now, one of the features of Mantra, which is very powerful, is that where there is a parameter of a shader, in this case, base color map, uh, and you also find an attribute on a point or a primitive that is being shaded, then the value of uh, the attribute on the uh, primitive will override the value set here in the shader parameter dialog. So in this case, we can set the base color map, in other words, the texture map, for each sphere by having that attribute, that named attribute, on the primitives of that sphere and making sure that name is the same as the name of this parameter. And that is why when we render, and hopefully it won't take too long to render, when we render, we should find uh, that we get a different texture on each of our spheres and, and we can see that each sphere or most of the spheres have different colors and textures applied to them from the choices I had. So that's how we override individual textures uh, for each sphere during the render. Finally I'd like to say a little bit about the rendering setup I've got for this scene. Let me switch off that render. Uh, and let me just have a look first of all here at the scene network and this node here which contains all the spheres uh, has geometry velocity blur enabled 
And this is one way of ensuring that when you have a dynamics network, you can apply motion blur. And all geometry velocity blur does, as you will remember, is take the point attributes for velocity, which exist on every point, and these are put there by uh, the dot network. Uh, when you import from a dot network, you get these velocity attributes. It uses these attributes to help build the motion blur. The second thing I've done here is use uh, the geometry tab here to ensure that we're rendering polygons of subdivision. That's why we're getting nice smooth spheres from our polygonal spheres. And let's have a quick look at the output nodes. Uh, they're both the same. The only difference is the range uh, allows you to render frames 1 to 100. And I should note that uh, I've changed the animation options because the tutorials I put up uh, are all done at 10 frames per second. I've changed the animation options here so that, so that it runs at 10 frames per second. So for the mantra render, we're in fact using the micropolygon physically based renderer. Now the reason we're using the micropolygon renderer rather than the simple ray trace physically based renderer is because we want to use quite a lot of motion blur. And although the micropolygon version of PBR is slower, it, it needs more samples to get a nice even render, although it's slower in general, it's faster when you're using quite a lot of motion blur. So in this case, it's worth using. And on the sampling tab, I've enabled both depth of field and motion blur. Uh, you can see I've add a little bit of motion factor here, which means that it, it'll spend less time shading micropolygons that are moving really fast. I've also increased the pixel samples. Uh, the default is 3 by 3 and I've increased it to 6 by 6. And it's worth remembering that when you're using micropolygon rendering, these pixel samples are not increasing the quality of things like reflections or lighting. Uh, all they're doing here is increasing the quality of the motion blur. The thing which increases the shading quality uh, when you're talking about physically based rendering is this min ray samples parameter here which I've set to 32 which means there are a maximum of 32 samples being taken for reflections and lights and so on at each point. So that's the rendering setup and that I think completes my overview of how to achieve this effect in Houdini and I hope you enjoy playing about uh, with the scene.